meters long in something like 10 seconds so quite short it was constrained by the size of the gym that we found to fly it in yeah so <laughs> that's that's a play uh, so now I'm going to how it actually works so here we have a model of the plane and we're going to be focusing on these thin wires which are paired with um, air foils in a bag so now if we zoom in to just like a cross-section of one pair of thin wires and air foils uh, it looks something like this. So here's our thin wire and airfoil. Uh, the thin wire is positively charged, uh, positive 20 kilovolts, and then the airfoil is negatively charged, negative 20 kilovolts. Um, and this is just the nitrogen atoms in the air. So basically how the plane works is it's gonna ionize these nitrogen atoms by removing an electron. Uh, so the positive charge of the thin wire is gonna be able to create these nitrogen ions. And then these nitrogen ions are then attracted towards the negative charge since the nitrogen ions are positively charged. And they're basically being um, attracted to the back of the plane and in the process colliding with other air molecules and that's gonna propel the plane forward. So any questions? Okay. So now the actual data. So here's the first figure where we have distance on the x-axis, height on the y-axis. Uh, so the actual free flight was between this plus sign and these x's. And we see that for all 10 power flights, the, um, the plane had a higher height when the thruster was powered off compared to the beginning of free flight. And also the unpowered flights are acting as basically a control, showing that you really need the um, is really the ionic wind that's the part that's propelling the plane forward. So the key takeaway here is that the plane had a high gain for all 10 flights. 
Okay, so as I said before, um, the physical height gain is one thing, but then more importantly, we want to see if the plane was actually able to maintain its energy and whether it can um, actually continue sustaining that height for a longer duration of time. So here we have the energy equivalent height gain, which is factoring how much velocity the plane actually lost while it flew. Um, so the energy equivalent height rate gain is shown by the Dr. Gray bars. And we see that um, in all these flights, except for flights three, four, and five, there is a height gain, or an energy equivalent height gain. So that's a pretty good sign. And then the lighter shaded bars are the height, actual height gain that we saw before. Okay, so with this plane, there are a lot of limitations. Uh, the first of which is the thrust and power ratio. So this is a measure of efficiency <laughs> of the plane. We're basically looking at um, the amount of, how much thrust can be generated given a certain amount of power. So we want um, this value to be as high as possible since we have, want the maximum amount of thrust given the same amount of power. So here's the equation for thrust to power um, is equal to the reciprocal of ion mobility, which is how easily the ions are able to flow to the airfoil, the negative charge at the back, uh, times the magnitude of the electric field, which is how positively charged the thin wire is and how negatively charged the airfoil is, uh, added to the free stream air velocity, which is the velocity of the plane compared to like a solid object, or a stationary object. And basically, these are all values that we would want to increase, right? Because increasing any of these pretty much means increasing power. But then the issue we see is that by increasing these values, since we're taking the reciprocal to get the thrust to power, increasing any of these values results in thrust of the power ratio to decrease. So this is like a limitation and it shows as we increase power, then um, the power is becoming less and less efficiently converted back into thrust. So, uh, any questions? Okay, so the second thing they looked at is the thrust density. And here we're comparing the amount of thrust generated for um, a certain amount of area in the frontal area of the, rib, of the wings. So if uh, this is the plane, the frontal area is uh, like this part. Um, so here's a diagram. And here we see the thin wires are here. The airfoil is here. And basically, if you want to see the head of the plane, the plane would be facing up in this direction. Uh, so we want a higher thrust density since we want more thrust to be produced given the same amount of frontal area. And um, in this case, the frontal area is basically this delta times this phi. And by decreasing the delta here, we can basically increase the thrust density by decreasing the um, area. But then we actually see issues with uh, decreasing this delta since it raises issues with interference or basically uh, this pair of uh, wire with airfoil can start interfering with this pair. Uh, so there was an experiment in this, well first here's delta shown on the model of the plane. And this is an experiment from a separate paper. So on the x-axis we have the thrust and on the y-axis we have the thrust to power ratio. So as thrust is increasing, what's happening to the thrust to power ratio? Yeah, so the thrust to power ratio is decreasing as thrust increases. So this shows basically um, as thrust for power increases, the power is becoming less and less efficiently converted into thrust. Um, and now the black scatter plot shows um, our values when the delta is equal to six centimeters. The red scatter plot is when delta is equal to two centimeters. And the blue scatter plot is when delta is equal to one centimeter. And basically, as delta is decreasing, we uh, see a decrease in the, as delta decreases, we see a decrease in the thrust to power. But delta decreasing should be a good thing since that's increasing the thrust to density. So what this shows is there's a trade-off between thrust density and thrust to power. Basically, as you increase thrust density, you're decreasing thrust to power and vice versa. Uh, so the last limitation is the voltage requirements. Um, the plane requires a pretty high voltage difference. 
to basically um, strip the electrons off the nitrogen atoms. And in order to do this, um, they had to create a high, custom high voltage power converter. So here's a picture of the schematic. And really what's important is what do these limitations mean for us? And what it means is that while our expectation may be to have no more noise pollution and planes like these or drones like these flying uh, in the near future, the reality is that for now we're stuck with the normal <laughs> noise. So yeah, thanks for listening.